So uh, in the last lecture, I, I described how to organize perturbation theory. And uh, in the sense, you can construct the full theory. And this construction yields, at the end, a formal power series. And you can realize this uh, formal power series in terms of Hilbert space operators. So it's a very concrete construction. Of course, what you get is a formal power series, not a number. So to get numbers, you have to truncate the power series. And you get explicit formulas, which can be compared to experiments. But of course, in a formal power series, you have little or in general no control over errors. Of course, there is a lot of activity trying to nevertheless get some information over errors, but this is a difficult business. And uh, so uh, uh, um, the general statement is that you cannot control the errors. Now, uh, I want to report now about an alternative uh, approach where you directly construct the C star algebra generated by the S matrix and their relations. So this was proposed by Detlef Buchholz and myself. I already mentioned it uh, yesterday. So maybe I just show these two relations, which, which uh, we, oh, it's here, to require. Then we, we look at unitaries labeled by local functionals with compact support. This unitary S of F and S of zero should be one. And the unitaries should satisfy these two relations. One just expresses causality in this uh, somewhat more complicated form where you have three terms on the right hand side. This intermediate uh, interaction uh, capital G. And this holds if the support of F and the support of H are causally separated by a Cauchy surface. And so this is not specific to a given Lagrangian, but the second condition is specific to a, a certain Lagrangian. Namely, it tells you that the S of F, so the S matrix corresponding to the function F, is the same as the S matrix corresponding to a different functional, which is a shifted functional F plus the difference in the shift of the Lagrangian. And I explained that this is, uh, um, in a sense, an integrated version of the schwinger dyson equation. So it describes the field equation now on the level of these unitary operators. And and. Uh, this is a general fact. If you have a family of unitaries, you always can uh, define formally an, an, an algebra just by uh, writing words which are uh, products of, of unitaries. Take linear combinations of them, so just the free algebra, modulo these two relations. And um, then you want to define a C star norm on such an algebra. And um, first of all, you can. Uh, can ja, um, ich, ich hätte eine Frage. Ja. Und zwar, die S-Matrix sollte doch die Streuung beschreiben von einem System, oder? Ja. Genau. Und dann sollte sie doch, wenn ich eine Lagrange-Funktion vorgebe, relativ eindeutig sein. Aber man das die beiden Dinge, die sind nicht die Lagrange-Funktion. Die zweite enthält sie etwas, aber vermutlich legt das das S überhaupt nicht eindeutig fest, oder irre ich mich da? Ähm, das so S of F depends, so F is an additional interaction. F is an inter additional interaction. And, and it, uh, so this algebra depends depends on the choice of the Lagrangian, and what enters is not the Lagrangian itself, but this relative Lagrangian, so the difference of the shifted Lagrangian with respect to the original one. 
So the constant term in the Lagrangian does not matter. This is not seen. But the other structure is uh, relevant. So I don't uh, think that um, different, okay, you can have maybe different Lagrangian, oh, okay, I will come to this. So the, um, um, the structure of the algebra is, turns out at the end to be independent of the Lagrangian. But, but this map, which maps this functional capital F to the, to the S matrix S of F, this map uh, is, uh, depends on the Lagrangian. Yeah. So, so, the, so as a scattering matrix, it describes the scattering induced by this additional functional f. Yeah. That, that, that is the interaction with the f over and l is the free Lagrangian over. For instance, yeah. Of course, uh, for the formalism, it's not relevant whether l is the free or the interacting Lagrangian. F is just an additional interaction. Yeah, and it describes the, the change in the system induced by this additional interaction. This interaction is uh, restricted in space and time, so it has compact support. So it's, and the total effect of this interaction is this S matrix S of F. And uh, of course you can ask the question whether the map F in S of F is faithful, uh, is ejective. This is not the case as this relation, which I, uh, this dynamical relation, which is the uh, unitary version of the Schwinger Dyson equation. Uh, but, but can one describe for a fixed, act, fixed action functional? Can one describe, or can one get a unique S uh, describing uh, scattering or uh, yeah. by these requirements you pose? Uh, Yes, see, the, uh, the algebra is completely determined by these two relations. And, uh, okay, I will, will try it in the following to, to uh, draw some conclusions from these relations. Of course, one has to work it out uh, to see which relations you can derive from these basic relations. M maybe I just continue, then you see more details, yeah? So, so... Um, Thank you. Okay. So, um, so this gives, gives an, an algebra, and this algebra, uh, you can define a norm on this algebra, which makes it to the Banach algebra by just um, giving any unitary operators a norm one, and then you have linear combinations of unitaries, and you take the, uh, the infimum of all, and then this gives, uh, you just uh, take the absolute value of the coefficients and sum them, and you take the minimum of all such representations. This gives you a Banach algebra norm. And then you can, um, you can show that there is also a C-star norm, and then you take the maximal C-star norm, which gives you a unique C-star algebra. This is a general procedure in C-star algebra theory uh, once you have a family of unitaries with some relations, you always can construct a C-star algebra, which is unique. And But we can now do this for, for um, any given Lagrangian. And, uh, of course, the Lagrangian of this form I mentioned at the beginning, so with this kinetic part determined by a metric and an uh, uh, potential part, which does not depend on the derivatives. So we constructed this Harkastle net now for any given Lagrangian, which is, I think, really surprising that this is possible, that um, in spite of all these problems to construct quantum field series here, you, we have a direct construction. Um, of course, uh, I will discuss what this really means, uh, but uh, at the moment we should just fix this. So the, this Arkastler net is not an, only an axiomatic uh, thing, but we can give a concrete realization for every Lagrangian. Now let me describe one relation you can derive from the framework. And this is a relation when you concentrate on the free Lagrangian so where this potential part is just uh, uh, 
m squared times phi squared. So just uh, the m might be also zero, but uh, this doesn't matter here. And uh, we look at functionals which are linear in the in the field phi, and maybe in, in addition have some constant contribution. And I will show that this sub algebra, th that this subset of S matrices corresponding to these functionals uh, creates a sub algebra. And actually, sub algebra we know very well. So let me just explain this. So we take the Klein Gordon operator, or better, minus the Klein Gordon operator. Then we compute this relative Lagrangian or the relative action, perhaps one should say. So it's the integral over the difference of the two Lagrangians, which is then just this, has this linear term, which contains a field equation and a quadratic term. Now I take two such test functions, f and g. Assume that they are compactly supported. Then I always can do the following. I can split the test function f into a sum of two terms, f0 plus k times psi, psi compactly supported, such that the support of f0 does not intersect the path of support of g. Yeah, so, so I use just, just the properties of the uh, solution of the Klein-Gordon operators to write an, an arbitrary test function in this form. This is always possible. So I can now express this in terms of this relative Lagrangian. So integral f times phi is the same as integral f0 phi plus the delta L of psi. And then there is this quadratic term which I have to subtract. OK, now I use this dynamical equation. Namely, I use the fact that in, uh, when I look at this right hand side, that this uh, adding of this uh, delta L of psi corresponds to a shift in phi. So this leads to this to this equation. So I have here a shift in phi, and of course I have this quadratic term which uh, remains the same as before. What is useful on this formula? The use of this formula is that here you have a function which has support in the uh, support of f, the test function f. Here, the support of the function is the support of f0. Yeah, because the constant function it does not depend on phi, so its support is empty. So then now I apply this role of uh, this law of um, causal separation. So I take the product of these two S matrices, one with F, the other with G, replace the F in the form of this uh, equation before. So I get these entries. But now I can just add this second functional integral G times phi. Oh, this is a typo here. This should be phi, not, not psi. Sorry. So then I apply again the dynamical equation, but now with minus psi, so I go in the opposite direction. And I make a shift here in the opposite direction, which gives f naught times phi. And I make a shift for this uh, g times phi, which gives g times phi plus psi. The, the, uh, and then I add this delta L of psi. This is the sum of these two terms. 
and um, the quadratic term is just cancelled and it remains this linear term. Okay, now, but now I see I get here f naught plus k times psi, k applied to psi, the whole thing multiplied by phi, so this is just the original f. So I have the integral of f plus g times phi plus this additional term integral of g times psi. What is psi? Psi is given by this equation above. So k psi is just the difference of f minus f naught. And then I can apply the retarded propagator and I get the psi back because psi has compact support. So this, uh, uh, on these functions, this is um, the, the uh, Tangon operator is invertible. Now the retarded propagator applied to F naught never meets the support of G because uh, the support of the retarded propagator is in the future and the um, and we had this condition at the beginning that the support of F naught does not intersect the path of support G. So these two functions have disjoint support. So I can, in this integral, omit the contribution from F naught, and I get this simple formula. So S of integral F phi times S of integral G phi is just S of integral F plus G phi plus this constant term here. What is this constant term? Actually, this is a term which we understand very well. Namely, I, this is, these are just the, uh, the uh, well-known Weyl relations, and they uh, imply the canonical commutation relations. Namely, we can add to this linear function a constant term such that you get a one-parameter group, just, uh, okay, this is a simple calculation that this is a one parameter group if you use this uh, law of composition on the other side. So I define this to be the Weyl operator, so the exponentiated field. And the relation before now reads like this. So you have two such Weyl operators. You get the Weyl operator of the sum times some factor, which is thus the S matrix corresponding to these anti-symmetric functional of G and F. Now, uh, we know already that this is uh, something in the center of the algebra, and I assume now that this is just a number. Yeah, that's uh, an additional assumption. You could uh, have the possibility that the center is larger, but but uh, let's assume that the center is as small as it can be. So then this is just a number and uh, I would have a free parameter here, maybe h bar, but here I just uh, use h bar equal one. So I assume that s of a constant functional is e to the i c. And then I can, this is just the number, and I can then uh, take the derivative functional derivative of the Weyl operators, provided I have a representation of these relations where the Weyl operators are differentiable, and I find the usual canonical commutation relation for the free field. So this is just this commutator function, which is the difference of the retarded propagator and its adjoint, which is the advanced propagator. And, um, and if you uh, Restrict this then again to a time, given time slice. This just produces the canonical commutation relation of canonical quantization. So this uh, framework which uh, we proposed here contains the usual canonical quantization um, for the free field. And um, but technically, it is much better because you, you, uh, you directly get the Weyl relation, which is a much nicer relation than this relation because this relation involves unbounded, op or here, 
distributions, but after integration with test functions, unbounded operators. There are a lot of domain questions you can discuss. Here you don't have any domain questions. These are just unitaries in some C-star algebra. So, so this formalism contains the usual formalism directly. In this sense, it's a real alternative to, um, to canonical quantization. Now I want to discuss a recent application of this framework. Actually, this is not, um, not complete at the moment. It's a work in preparation with uh, Romeo Brunetti, Michael Dutsch, and uh, Kasia Reisner. And it concerns the question whether one can derive Noether's theorem in quantum field theory. Now, we know that, of course, symmetries and conservation laws are intimately connected by Noether's theorem. This is well known in classical physics. In quantum field theory, you have similar relations, but there are some complications. For instance, you can have anomalies. And moreover, there are all these technical problems, because when you do it in this framework of canonical quantization, you have rather ill-defined expressions and it's not so easy to uh, make sense out of them. So I want to describe our attempts to understand this connection in this C-star algebraic setting. Now it turned out to be useful to... Uh, second more. turned out to be useful to to enrich this formalism of locally covariant quantum field theory by uh, adding further arrows, namely uh, those arrows which correspond to interactions. So we look at a new category, which here is called Dun for dynamical, sp dynamical space times. And the objects are now triples, where M is a globally hyperbolic space sum as before, L is a Lagrangian, and we also have to fix it in distinguished time orientation. And we consider now in this category morphisms. And we, um, so we have these morphisms which we already considered in this locally covariant framework, namely embedding of one manifold into another manifold, and such that now the Lagrangians, the, the pullback of the Lagrangian in L prime is just L, and of course the time. Uh, the, the time orientation should also be uh, related by this uh, embedding chi. So these are the um, arrows we already had in the previous framework. Now we add two, three other kinds of arrows, namely one is the affine field redefinition, where we replace our field configuration phi by linear map applied to phi, so A should be a, should be a, um, a, a matrix, so if phi is an n-component field, so A is just a n by n matrix, and you multiply it point-wise. And then you can add an constant, uh, an additional smooth function, phi naught. So this is an affine field redefinition. We let the uh, choose the same manifold, m prime is equal m. The Lagrangians should be related by this affine field rate definition, and the time orientations of others remain the same. In, now, then we have uh, arrows corresponding to interactions. So we can have the situation that we have an interruption, which is 
has a support which is past compact, so it takes place essentially in the future of some Cauchy surface. And the manifolds are the same, and the uh, new Lagrangian L prime plus this interaction B is the interaction uh, is the Lagrangian L. And, the, and then we can also do the opposite, where the support F is future compact, and uh, the other relations will remain the same. So a quantum field theory, in this sense, now is a functor between from this uh, uh, category to the category of C star algebras. And each algebra A of M is just the algebra I've discussed before. This is a C star algebra generated by the S matrices S of F by these two relations I mentioned. Now, um, I um, describe the, the, uh, uh, the morphisms I get by mapping the, these morphism yota with some of these possibilities. Um, so this gives a new, it gives a homomorphism between the CISA algebras and which I abbreviate by alpha. So in the case where chi is an endomorphism, this is just what we already had. So S of F is mapped to S of chi uh, uh, star below F. So this is the push forward of F. Then we have this field redefinition where we just, um, S of F is just S of F times the inverse of this field redefinition. And then we have the arrows corresponding to the interaction. So one is the uh, uh, possibility of retarded interaction. So then S of F is mapped here. This is just the Google Uber formula I explained before. Now, what is V of F? Now, V of F is just um, the restriction of this new interaction V, uh, which you get by integrating it with the test function f, which is equal to 1 on a sufficiently large region. And uh, because of this re uh, property that this is a retarded interaction, this um, um, the right-hand side is independent of the choice of f, provided it's equal to 1 on a sufficiently large region. There you can imagine to go to the limit, but it, uh, for sufficiently large regions, uh, it does not depend uh, on the uh, on the choice of f, and uh, then here you get the corresponding thing for the advanced interaction value. Then just this inverse uh, of this s matrix is on the right hand side, and then for for each arrow, so because each arrow in the category din is. Um, is um, a product of these elementary arrows, and the same then holds for, for these arrows. So, of course, one has to check that all of these maps are really uh, homomorphisms. Actually, it turned out that, that if chi is, a, is a bijective, then all these maps are even isomorphisms. You just check that the relations is uh, causal factorization relation and this dynamical relation are preserved by these maps and that these maps are invertible. Okay. Uh, again, I can... Okay. Now I look at special cases. The one case is that um, the, um, that we look at these arrow chi for, for some diffeomorphism. So we have M prime is the same manifold as M, and chi is a compactly supported diffeomorphism of M. That, and uh, then we have, uh, as before, that uh, the, the pullback 
of L prime is L and the pullback of the time orientation T prime is T. Now we look, now yet uh, I think the difference from this general situation before is that now L and L prime are Lagrangians on the same space time because M prime is equal M. So we can look at the difference of the two Lagrangians and integrate it. And for this, we need the fact that this diffeomorphism has compact support. So this is well-defined functional, which we can treat as an interaction. This means that in this case, we have two, uh, we have different arrows between these two uh, objects. Namely, we have this arrow yota chi from M to M prime. And we have the arrow corresponding from this delta chi L, which we consider as an interaction. This is a known arrow from M prime to M. And we can do it for the advanced or the retarded uh, interaction because uh, the support of this uh, functional is compact. And then we can combine these two isomorphisms and get an automorphism of A of N. So this is now this formula, alpha plus of S of F is now just given by this expression, S of delta chi L to the minus one, S of delta chi L plus the push forward of F. And the, retar the advanced uh, map uh, looks the same up to this uh, fact that the delta, S of delta chi L is on the, to the minus one is on the other side. Okay, now as similar as we did uh, last uh, in the last lecture for the for the uh, shift in the Lagrangian, we can use a time slice axiom, and we take an F which has support, say, in the past of the support of chi. Then we use the factorization, and the factorization just applies to the second factor and says that this is just a product of the S matrix of the first and the S matrix of the second term. But then this term cancels with this term. So what we find is that alpha plus of S of F is equal to S of F. Now, if we have now, in addition, the time slice axiom, we know that the algebra generated by the S of F, or Fs in this uh, path of the support of chi, they are already the full algebra. So you, we find from the time slice axiom an additional relation, namely that alpha plus is actually the identity. And uh, of course, the same holds then for alpha minus, which in addition tells you that S of delta chi L is in the center of the algebra. Okay, so this is the consequence of this formula. And I uh, describe the same now for this field redefinition. So uh, phi is this compactly uh, affine field redefinition now assumed to be compactly supported. And L prime is uh, composed, composed with phi is just L and T prime is equal to T. Again, we can look at the difference of the two Lagrangians given by, uh, denoted by delta phi L. And then again, I have a, arrow from M to M prime, and another arrow from M prime to M, depending now on this uh, interaction, and get uh, automorphisms of this algebra, which I noted here, or oh, here, this should be a phi, sorry. And use again causal factorization 
and the time slice axiom, they get that this is the identity. So I do, uh, so I is, so uh, what happened is the following: I added this assumption of the that the time slice axiom holds to the relations I had before. And from this, I derive these other uh, relations. Now I can uh, 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 combine these uh, two possibilities. I look at the group generated by these compactly supported diffeomorphisms and these affine field redefinitions. So this group is parameterized by this uh, uh, matrix valid function A, by this smooth function phi naught, by this diffeomorphism chi, all of them compactly supported. And G applied to phi is uh, then defined by this formula. So I uh, compose phi with chi to the minus one, multiplied by this uh, matrix A, and add this uh, function phi naught. You see, I have a push forward G uh, uh, star uh, applied to F, which just F composed with the inverse of G. And then I get this identity, S of F is equal to S of delta GL to the minus one times S of delta GL plus G star F for all G's, all uh, G's in this uh, group GC. This is called the unitary master board identity. And uh, the reason for this name is that there is an identity and perturbation theory, which was uh, found by uh, Michael Dutch and collaborators some time ago. And this, um, uh, this relation, if you take the infinitesimal version of this relation, this is a relation which holds a perturbation theory. But now it holds in this algebra, provided the time slice axiom. Okay, now I want to apply this to Noether's theorem. So I look at the group generated by diffeomorphisms and affine field redefinitions now, now without support restrictions. And look at this, the subgroup, this group, which leaves the Lagrangian invariant. So for instance, take the uh, Lagrangian on Minkowski space, then typically this Lagrangian is invariant under uh, Poincaré transformations. So the Poincaré transformations are then just diffeomorphisms, but special diffeomorphisms uh, which leaves the Lagrangian invariant. And typically, None of these uh, elements of GL is at the same time in this group GC because they have this compact support restriction. But what can happen is that the given um, an element of the symmetry group of the Lagrangian, that you find an element of the this uh, group GC, such that the two coincide on a certain region. Let me take the support of, of functional F, then look at the intersection of the future and the past of this support. This is a slightly larger region, and you require that these two transformations coincide on this region. And then the push forward, these two transformations on F coincide. Moreover, the support of this change of L and the support of F, uh, the intersection of these two is uh, the empty set. 
Okay, now uh, uh, try to imagine how this looks like. So, so we have the support of F. Maybe I try to draw it here. So this is the support of F, and uh, this J cap of, of, uh, of uh, support of F is more or less the same, no, slightly larger. And uh, where is this delta H of L localized? It's just in the surrounding here. Yeah. Here, this is this delta. essentially just a region which surrounds the support of, of F. Now I decompose this delta HL into two parts, one corresponding so I, I so I have now the Q minus which is or maybe I take a different I take a different color yeah uh, which is this and I have the Plus, it is a support here. There's some overlap region, but this overlap region is space like to the support of F. So, so I can do this in such a way that the support of Q plus does not intersect the path of the support of F and the support of Q minus does not intersect the future of the support of F. And then I apply this unitary mass about identity and I get the following formula. I have S of F, here I have S of delta HL to the minus 1, but delta, delta HL is Q plus plus Q minus, this is this term here. And here I have uh, the uh, other term in this um, master word identity. Now I use this factorization rule. So first of all I use the fact that Q minus is in the past of the support of G star F. So I get a factor S of Q plus plus Q minus to cancel this term. Then I have a term S of Q minus to the minus one with this term. And then I have uh, the term Q minus S of Q minus plus G star F. Now again, this factorizes, so I get this product here. What I see now is the following. I have the automorphism S of F goes into S of G star F. Yeah, because uh, this map G star um, uh, is an automorphism because G leaves the Lagrangian invariant and of, of the causal relations uh, are preserved. And um, this S of Q minus is a unitary, so you see that this automorphism is implemented by a unitary operator. So what is the interpretation? The interpretation is now that this Q minus is something like the charge corresponding to the symmetry. So we constructed locally the charge corresponding to the symmetry, so you can imagine this as the current 
corresponding to the symmetry integrated with the test function and then exponentiated. But mathematically, it's much nicer than the current itself because this is a unitary operator, not just an unbounded operator. So in this sense, one sees here a um, version of Noether's theorem derived only from very basic, basic principles. Maybe the most uh, delicate principle here is the assumption that the time slash axiom holds true. But um, when you look at the situation of these um, um, uh, when you have these locally um, comp uh, compactly supported um, diffeomorphism, you can imagine a diffeomorphism which um, describes a time shift, time translation locally. And then you use this formula and you see that the support of F and the support of the transformed F uh, are shifted in time from each other. Now, also Q minus is is uh, um, just part uh, is uh, in a different region than the original support of F. So when you um, evaluate this carefully, you see that this um, uh, this uh, unitary mass about relation really implies the time slice axiom. So you, you see that uh, this unitary mass support identity is not only a consequence of the time slice axiom, it's even equivalent to this. And I think this is a strong evidence that this is a good relation. Of course, one should be careful because we know that um, symmetries in quantum field theory can have anomalies. The question is where remain the anomalies now. Uh, one possible place where anomalies can occur is that these, in this formula, these are elements of the center, but not necessarily one. So, uh, roughly speaking, when you, you could also try to uh, derive this formula in the path integral formalism. And then this constant factor here would correspond to the Jacobian of the transformation. Of course, this Jacobian is, uh, if it's not one, it's usually ill-defined. So this is a problem of associating determinants to such to uh, operators in infinite, uh, infinite dimensional spaces, which is, uh, itself a complicated problem. But uh, so this is one part where anomalies can occur. There is another um, uh, other situation uh, which could be responsible for anomalies, namely when you say, say you represent your estimate, you have a representation of the vial algebra, say the vacuum uh, of the free theory. And then you look for operators S of F for more general functionals in the box space of the vacuum representation. And if the, the symmetry of the Lagrangian is already symmetry of the free Lagrangian, then you have a unitary implementation of this symmetry on Fox space. But there is no guarantee that this automorphic map here uh, coincides with the transformation which is induced by the by the um, uh, unitary representation of the Fox space. So this could be another source of the anomalies, but I think this problem is presently not really well understood. Okay, let me end with some remarks, uh, uh, some outlook. So I try to uh, to describe how concepts of algebraic quantum field theories combined with ideas from category theory solve 
long-standing problems of quantum field theory. So maybe the most important part of this is the solution of the renormalization for quantum field theories on curved space-time. But there are other things which also can be treated in this framework and which, uh, uh, which could not be treated in other frameworks. Actually, in general, um, the, uh, when you look at this perturbative uh, algebraic quantum field theory, it just contains uh, other construction, uh, perturbative constructions of quantum field theory. So all of them are subsumed in this, in this framework. We have also made some progress uh, concerning the existence of quantum field theories. Namely, it's no longer a question whether these quantum field theories exist, but the question is now, what are the states of this quantum field theory? Now, these are sister algebras, they always have states, but do they have states which for some reasons are suitable to describe situations we are interested in? For instance, we can ask whether there is a vacuum state. Not, this is not guaranteed. Actually, there are counterexamples, for instance, the uh, massless scalar field in two dimensions does not have a vacuum state. So it's not uh, always true that there's a vacuum state, but uh, this would be a good question. But there could be other uh, criteria for interesting states. It's not clear at the moment what these criteria are. But in any case, I think the problem of constructing quantum field theory is now transformed in the question whether you can construct certain states on these quantum field theories. There's one severe restriction. At the moment, this formalism has been, uh, is not applied to Fermi fields, and more important, it's not applied to gauge theories. And actually, some of these assumptions are not fulfilled in gauge theories. For instance, uh, I mentioned that these um, symmetries of the Lagrangians and these local symmetries uh, are disjoint. This is not true in gauge theories, yeah, because in gauge theories you have local symmetries which uh, are symmetries of the Lagrangian. So, so in this sense, the formalism has to be changed or modified for gauge theories. Of course, in the perturbative uh, situation, this is well understood, that we have the uh, VB, BRST formalism, which was also discussed in other talks at this uh, workshop. So this uh, is well understood in the perturbative approach, but uh, at the moment it's not clear whether this can be formulated in this uh, C-star algebraic framework. Because in this uh, usual framework, you have all these uh, Rassmann algebras and uh, everything is infinitesimal. So, so it's not clear how to, to uh, get a C-style algebra formulation. Now, uh, I, uh, at least according to the previous uh, to the program I have seen, next week there should be a talk of Alexander Schenkel. Is it true? Um, and he will then probably tell us more about uh, how to treat this algebraic framework and more generality in particular, so that also gauge series can be included. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Are there questions from here or from the online participants? So just unmute your microphone if you want to say something. How do you reproduce in a simple case like uh, um, 5 to the 4 theory uh, or Minkowski space the usual S matrix scattering from your S matrix or S operators, or C star elements. 
Yeah. So so um, so when you uh, you just take the phi to the four, integrate it with the test function, and this is just this S matrix um, which I described. Now, of course, the S matrix uh, from which you get the scattering results would um, uh, would be the limit where this test function goes to one. This limit does not exist within the algebra. But there you had to go to a vacuum representation of the theory. And in this vacuum representation, then you uh, can do the ordinary uh, scattering theory. And you will then just, uh, uh, yeah, you, you then have to prove that this limit exists. And um, this is not solved by these methods I described. So this is called the adiabatic limit. And the adiabatic limit is known to exist in certain cases, but there are also cases where it's not known. So phi to the four with a mass gap, there it's known that the limit exists. But for instance, when you have no mass gaps, then the situation is more complicated. There is um, recent progress by the work of Pavel Duch, who showed that in quite a number of theories with massless particles, the adiabatic limit also exists. But for instance, in gauge theories, in, in non abelian gauge theories, it's not clear. I think there you cannot even expect that the limit exists because you uh, you expect that uh, you have confinement, and confinement is not visible in perturbation theory. So in this framework, you should not expect that the limit exists. But there are some arguments um, which are not completely rigorous how to treat the infrared problem in non abelian gauge theories. So th I think that practitioners and calculations do something, but to my knowledge, the proofs are not complete. But there's this abstract Hackbrell scattering theory, which almost implies once you have succeeded to construct the theory with a vacuum state and where you have a mass gap in the theory, then you can just prove it in general. So this applies in any case. But in the massless case, you have, uh, you have problems. Okay, are there further questions? Um, uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Um, so what happens in the presence of, of a horizon? How well is this understood in this formalism? Yeah, uh, actually this is an interesting uh, question. So, so, so um, for instance, it takes Schwarzschild space-time. The outside of the Schwarzschild space-time the so outside of the horizon is a globally hyperbolic uh, manifold. So the theory applies there. Um, the, uh, then you could extend the uh, Schwarzschild space time, say to the Kruska space time, which is again globally hyperbolic. So you can also there do the same analysis. Yeah, and there you can also see what happens at the horizon. So, so locally, of course, this is a, uh, here the local aspects are emphasized. So locally, nothing happens at the horizon. Yeah, because this is just a smooth manifold, and uh, this is a subregion of a smooth manifold. And so yeah. there uh, is n no singularity. Yes, and uh, so can one then treat whatever uh, Hawking radiation in a, in a satisfactory way? Um, I think we did it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I think there was a paper by Rudolf Haag and myself, uh, okay. 30 years old, where we treated um, uh, uh, Haag radiation, of course, only for the free case. So we analyzed the massless scalar field on a Schwarzschild space time, uh, on a Schwarzschild, but on a collapse on a space time describing a rotation symmetric collapse. 
Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, and there, there you can show that you get Hawken graduation at the end. But this was an, uh, the uh, what the free theory. So it's not so clear how to do it for the interrupting theory because um, uh, you you need uh, to understand uh, the behavior at uh, asymptotic times because the Hawking variation is something which happens at uh, at infinity, light like or time like infinity. And, um, not not in a finite region, and so so. Uh, I think this is not clear. Um, I, I think I'm not aware of any uh, convincing treatment of interrupting for the rocking, interaction for the rocking variation. Because locally, the situation is more or less the same as for the for the uh, free theory, but um, these global aspects. Um, they involve long distance properties of interactive field series, which can be quite different from the free theory. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have more questions. Uh, yes, I had a question on this um, category uh, that you introduced. Yeah. Um, introduce three extra types of morphisms and two of them they um, they add an interaction with either retarded or advanced support um, or past compact or future compact support um, yeah. does that mean that if you uh, compose the two that you can add any type of interaction yes and that's a nice way of showing that uh, all these algebras are isomorphic okay yes Okay, that was exactly my question. Yeah. 